Rivers of the Mobile Tensaw River Delta flow into Mobile Bay stands Five Rivers, Alabama's newest conservation facility. We're here to serve as a gateway to conservation education, outdoor recreation, and land stewardship, not just in the Mobile Tensaw River Delta, but throughout coastal Alabama. We're blessed with a tremendous biological and natural resource diversity in coastal Alabama, and Five Rivers stands to put people in touch with that outdoor world. From the lush green forest and slow moving waters of the northern delta to the sparkling white sands and emerald green waters of the gulf, Baldwin County's natural beauty and abundance is unparalleled throughout the southeast and the United States as a whole. Whether you've lived here one day, one year, or all your life, it's evident that the natural beauty is abundant. And odds are, if you just moved here, you came here for that beauty. And the fact that this area is so abundant in natural resources has not been lost on generations before this. Uh, with the advent of the earliest inhabitants, the Native Americans thousands of years ago, to the uh, inhabitation of the area by the Spanish, French, English, and later on Americans, the natural beauty of Baldwin County has captured the hearts and minds of numerous peoples. Most recently, the Baldwin County Department of Archives and History, in conjunction with the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources at the Five Rivers Center, located on the Mobile Bay Causeway, celebrated this natural beauty by celebrating the life and times of William Bartram. Bartram, who was a naturalist and botanist, made a tour through Baldwin County in 1775, where he recorded uh, many new plants, many species of, of animal that can only be seen in Baldwin County. Those things can still be seen today by residents along the Tinsall River, along the Mobile Delta. William Bartram, who spent time in Baldwin County, uh, made his headquarters at the farm of Major Robert Farmer, who was a retired English soldier living in Baldwin County along the Tinsall. Bartram discovered a lot of the natural beauty that has not been lost on Baldwin County over the centuries since. And in our recent celebration at the William Bartram Trail Conference held here at the Five Rivers Center, scholars from all over the southeast and along the eastern seaboard of the United States gathered to discuss what had happened here in Baldwin County, the travels of William Bartram, and to revisit some of those same locations that Bartram would have walked and paddled in by canoe when he was here in 1775. Many of the participants of the trail conference actually paddled along what is now designated as the Bartram Canoe Trail along the Northern Delta. They walked along the sands of Gulf Shores and Fort Morgan in an effort to try to relive the travels by ship that Bartram would have taken on his way to Pensacola. Five Rivers Center here on the causeway on Mobile Bay is a magnificent place to begin your journey into the Mobile River Delta. It offers a museum where I'm sitting right now that gives viewers a, a, a very hands-on aspect of the wildlife that has existed in Baldwin County and still exists in Baldwin County. It's a good place to get familiar with some of the flora and the fauna that you'll experience out in the River Delta itself. You can also, from this point uh, at, at the uh, northern part of the bay, actually enter into the river system and canoe northward into the Mobile River Delta along the Tinsaw and actually retrace some of the steps that William Bartram paddled some 200 years ago. Five Rivers is Alabama's newest conservation facility. We just opened the doors of the facility in April of 2007. We have a, a, a three-pronged mission. Uh, we, plan to, we hope to be a gateway to outdoor recreation, conservation education, and land stewardship here in this tremendous Mobile Tensaw River Delta. Uh, in the last decade, the Conservation Department, specifically through the Forever Wild program, has purchased uh, about 50,000 new acres of public land in this delta, bringing the public land holding to 107,000 acres of the 200 plus thousand acres of wetlands behind me. It's a tremendous uh, educational resource, outdoor recreational resource, 
And the purpose of Five Rivers is to get people connected with this tremendous delta. Five Rivers has seven buildings on approximately 80 acres at the southern end of the Mobile Tensaw Delta. The very first building you see when you come into the site is our Shell Bank Visitor Center. The, the purpose of this facility is to orient you to, to the Delta and the experiences you can have in here. And if, it's, if you've never been here, it sets the entire place in context within our local history and Alabama's natural history. Uh, Bartram Landing is our canoe and kayak shop. We have an outfitter, Five Rivers Outfitters, who provides canoe and kayak sales, rentals, guided tours, and lessons. If you already have a kayak or a canoe, feel free to bring it out and launch for free on our floating dock facility and start exploring the Delta. It is a gateway to the Bartram Canoe Trail, which is a 200-mile uh, trail system throughout the Mobile Tensaw River Delta with camping platforms and, and land-based campsites throughout. The canoe and kayak store is, is one facet of the Five Rivers program. And we do our kayak and canoe rentals, but we are, as people come and would like to rent, uh, we'll give them some basic instructions, where you go, how you do this, uh, ideas to safety is of primary importance. What we'd like to do is uh, have people enjoy themselves, enjoy the trip, come back. You can rent a boat here if you wanted to and then take it after you uh, paddle this area, you can paddle up in the delta further to see more of the Bartram Canoe Trail. Um, this is a really a beautiful place. It's one that people can uh, as they tour this whole area, a lot of times they'll stop by. We just had a Boy Scout troop come by doing a nature walk. We have a pretty wide selection of boats down at the bottom. And as people go out, being the men, we still do the maintenance work, so I have a lot of boats to wash up, put up, you know, take care of. What I want to show them is how you hold the uh, paddle. So you would hold it about shoulder's length. The best paddling form is just to kind of twist your shoulders, reach forward, pull back. You don't want to go too far back in the water because then you just start picking up the water. You can feather your paddle or not, that's turning one blade into the wind. One of the main things to know about kayaking is that you really got to keep your balance. It's incredibly stable, a lot more stable than it looks, but you keep your nose right over the center line at all times. You can reach as far as you want but don't lean, don't lean an inch. And then uh, as the, perhaps a wave comes, the boat will rock back and forth, that's fine. Just keep your nose right above the center line and you just swivel your hips back and forth. When I came across Mobile Bay a couple of years ago, the waves were about three feet high. And I was going horizontal to the waves and so the boat really rocked back and forth, but I kept my head and nose right above the center line, wasn't any problem at all. Uh, it's kind of natural kayaking, it's natural movements, people can figure it out right away. If they have any questions right off the dock, they'll ask. One of the things that we'll see it as we go out into Justin Bay, or probably an alligator, Sonny, or maybe two. One of the young boys, when they came back earlier, earlier today, said they saw eight alligators. But the alligators are afraid of you, they'll try to get away from you. If if uh, you approach too close, but if you are in their path, then they might appear to be coming towards you where really they're just trying to escape into the water. But never, never, never feed alligators. Up the road a little bit at some of the restaurants, uh, we see mothers and fathers you know, showing the little child how they can toss some food to the alligator and he'll snap at it. But what happens is that the alligator loses his fear of people. And then when we do a paddle in that area, uh, the alligators won't be afraid of us and they'll come straight toward us. And uh, it gets a little hairy sometimes when they come right up to you and won't dodge, things like that. Our further around the facility, we have a conference center or classroom facility. Um, it is available for K-12 educational programs, uh, professional seminars, workshops. Uh, the building is very modular and flexible. And, get, and provides the opportunity for breakout sessions if you have a, a meeting over there or a group. The, the heart of the facility is really our nature center complex, which is a three building structure uh, that includes a 4,000 square foot exhibit hall, museum space, 
Delta Hall, which is our premier reception facility and also our administrative headquarters. And then we also have our Tensaw Theater. It's a 90-seat surround sound uh, theater and presentation room. Uh, it is our space for taking virtual tours into the Delta. Many of the folks who come here won't have an opportunity to get in a canoe or a kayak and get out and experience the Delta. The Tensaw Theater affords us the possibility of bringing it inside. Uh, we have everything but smell vision in there. We can tell you what it looks like and what it sounds like. Uh, we'll, we'll work on the smell for a later date. Um, we do have walking trails throughout the site. Uh, being an 80 acre facility, you're not going to walk for very far, but we did want to give a woodland experience, uh, which is very important in this area. Um, and we do have a, a powerboat dock. Uh, there's not a launch facility on the site, but if you come by boat, you can enter the facility, pick up your friends, and, and take your own tour of the Delta. The Appalachia Exhibit Hall is our, is our museum for the Delta. Uh, we have eons of natural history. We have centuries of cultural history. Uh, wildlife is very abundant in the Delta, and this is our space to tell those many stories. Uh, if you walk through the Exhibit Hall, you'll notice very quickly that very little is bolted down. Uh, it is not a permanent exhibit space. We intend to bring uh, three to four distinct exhibits each year into that facility. Uh, with, with so much history to talk about, we should have no problem keeping that, that facility uh, fresh and new so that you can keep coming back and learning more about the Delta. One of the center attractions that we have in the Appalachia Exhibit Hall is our very own version of Hogzilla. Uh, it is a wild uh, boar hog that was actually harvested in, in the Florida, uh, in Salem, Florida. This fellow weighed 812 pounds and um, was, was wild captured. Feral hogs are a real issue in the swamp system of the Delta. If you've never seen a good hog wallow, you don't have a feel for how much habitat destruction a single hog can provide. These animals are not native to our Delta, but they are out there in high abundance. Fortunately, they don't all get as large as Hogzilla, but uh, the many smaller ones we have out there do their uh, a significant amount of habitat destruction. And it's not just habitat destruction. In our Bottle Creek Indian Mound site, they are rooting around and, and actually having an adverse impact on some of our cultural resources, digging up pottery, digging up artifacts and uh, taking them out of context. So it's a real problem that we're trying to control a nuisance species within the Delta. Um, many people will walk into the Appalachia Exhibit Hall and be surprised to find that buffalo once roamed the coastal plains of Alabama. And uh, you might think that it was a long, long time ago, but in fact, even up into the 1700s, there were buffalo in South Alabama. Um, this is a species who once roamed our plains down here, but our habitat changes prompted them to move elsewhere. Uh, so they were forced out and now the only uh, natural populations of buffalo or bison are in the uh, western United States. One of our significant species within the delta is the alligator snapping turtle. Um, if you've never seen one, uh, it, it's hard to believe that a turtle could be quite this intimidating. Even just looking at the ridges along the back of the shell, you realize that you're dealing with a tough guy. Um, they call it an alligator snapping turtle for a reason. Uh, that upper beak uh, on, its, on its jaw can really do some damage and, and they will lock down. Uh, they lay at the bottom of the delta waterways. They have their mouth wide open and they dangle their tongue trying to attract fish and other critters. And as soon as they get in that mouth reach, they snap down and they've got lunch. So uh, it's okay when it's a fish. You probably don't want that to be your finger because they can really do some damage to you. Any good swamp is known for its alligator population, and that is probably the most recognizable uh, species we have in the Mobile Tensaw River Delta is alligators. Um, the American alligator is very common here. In fact, it's a conservation success story uh, for the Delta. At one point in time, the uh, alligator was considered a threatened species. Populations were low, and uh, in recent years, and through, due, due to conservation efforts, the numbers of alligators in the entire southeast have increased, and here in the Delta particularly, uh, they have increased to the point that the State Conservation Department has sanctioned an annual alligator hunt to begin controlling the population. Um, they are abundant. You see them everywhere. They are, uh, if you've never experienced it, you, you should probably look into experiencing the Delta at night. There are a lot of tour operations in the Bartram Canoe Trail can give you an opportunity to get out there at night. Uh, 
it's a different world at night. There are many creatures that are nocturnal that you will only see or hear at night. Uh, the giant bullfrog sounding its call throughout the night is a, a trademark sound of the Delta. If you think you see alligators in the daytime, just get out there at night uh, and shine a light. That's when you really see alligators in the Delta. Alabama black bear population is, a, is another uh, population that is getting uh, impacted by the urban growth here in coastal Alabama. Uh, biologists believe that there may only be fewer than a hundred black bears remaining in this Delta area. Most of those are in the uh, Saraland area of Mobile County. Um, black bears are a wide-ranging species. A single black bear needs a lot of land to cover. And that is one of the limitations uh, to that population is large tracts of upland are getting harder and harder to come by. Bears are accidental tourists of the Delta, but they don't live down in the swamps. They need large tracts of upland adjacent to the swamps as their main habitat source. Uh, there are biologists in the conservation department and researchers from the southeast who are working on efforts to increase our Alabama black bear population, uh, possibly through interbreeding with Louisiana and Florida populations and creating habitat corridors so that these bears at least have access to large tracts of land. Although rarely seen, Alabama has a very strong population of bobcats. Um, they're more often heard than seen. Any, anybody who's had a pet cat realizes how quiet and sneaky a cat can be, and bobcats are no exception to that. Uh, the many folks who uh, go into the delta or into the wild at night often hear bobcats uh, howling and crying at night. Uh, they're very active at night and typically sleep by day. Uh, but uh, occasionally you'll be lucky enough to come across one and if you hear it before you see it, it's something that can really get your attention. M many folks can, may be surprised to find that armadillos live in other places than roads because uh, that's where we mostly see them. Uh, armadillos are an example of a species that al although not native to this area, they have migrated into the area. They're, they're native to Central and South America, but over time their range has expanded and they have worked their way into the southwestern and then into the southeastern United States. They're not necessarily a species that has had a negative impact on our habitat uh, around here, but they are certainly a species that is new uh, to this area in, in, in recent history. Historically, uh, conservation efforts have been led by uh, hunters, uh, deer hunters, turkey hunters. Some of our oldest and best known conservation groups have existed uh, around those activities. The state of Alabama has very strong wildlife management programs. Uh, the deer population in the state of Alabama in particular is something that is highly managed and has been very successfully managed over the years to the point that uh, deer populations and herds throughout the state are very large. Uh, turkey hunting is another, uh, if, you, if you don't know any tur turkey hunters, uh, you may not realize this, but turkey hunters are a very passionate bunch. Uh, there is an amazing skill and technique to hunting the elusive turkey and people will dedicate their lives to, to uh, turkey hunting. And they want, they support conservation simply because they're supporting the maintenance of the habitat that is, that is necessary to sustain those animal species, those wild game species. Coastal Alabama is, is a significant spot for birders. Uh, each year in the spring and fall, we are on the edge of the Mississippi Flyway. So we have birds that are migrating north and south uh, to go to winter breeding grounds or summer, nest summer grounds. Um, if you've never seen it before, the fallout on Dolphin Island is amazing, uh, where the birds have been flying across the Gulf of Mexico, and Dolphin Island is the very first spit of land that they see. Um, these times of the year, our already high birding diversity in coastal Alabama is even accelerated. And Alabama has created a few programs to take advantage of that fact. The Alabama Coastal Birding Trail is a network of the best birding sites that we have to offer in coastal Alabama. Where, and there's a, a guidebook and a website to let you know the kinds of birds you will expect to see when you go to these places. In the fall each year, 
we host the Alabama Coastal Bird Fest, which is a series of guided tours in coastal Alabama uh, where birding experts take you to those hot spots and work with you on identifying and finding those birds. Uh, this is the sixth year that we've had the Bird Fest and it keeps growing each year. Uh, even though some years it's been impacted by hurricanes, folks just keep coming back and back. Birding is a, a tremendous industry that is growing and active in South Alabama. It's not just hunting and fishing, though, that supports conservation. Uh, there are opportunities in the state of Alabama to get outside and enjoy the natural resources through bird watching, through canoeing, kayaking. Uh, these non-consumptive uses of these uh, natural resources in the state are very important. And people do have an opportunity to support those. Uh, the state of Alabama recently um, created a outdoor heritage license. It's structured after similar hunting license programs uh, whereby anyone who is interested in just bird watching or these non-consumptive recreational purpose, uh, programs can purchase a license and the funding of that license is matched three to one by federal funds and is used to support habitat conservation so that you can enjoy those benefits provided by the habitat of bird watching and recreational activities that come with it. So there's an opportunity for anyone who is interested in conservation of land to participate in habitat management, habitat preservation through the Outdoor Heritage Program. The Delta is a vast system of over 250,000 acres of wetlands. Uh, and there's a high diversity of wetland systems even within the Delta. The southern third of the Delta is a brackish marsh, salt marsh system, uh, depicted mainly by grasses and giant reeds and rushes and such. The, as you go further north into the delta, it makes a transition to the bottomland hardwood forest community. This is sig signified by bald cypress trees, tupelo gum trees, uh, emergent wetland plants, water lilies and, and such. Uh, as you make that change in habitat, you also start picking up different species of animals that have grown and adapted to that habitat. Continue further up and get into the uplands you make the transition from the bottomland swamps into the uh, uplands, and that's where you'll start finding black bear. Uh, your live oaks start moving into the forest system up there. Even within what is globally a fairly small area, there's a tremendous habitat diversity within the delta. Uh, and everywhere you have a change in the plants community and the water community, you also have a change in the animal communities that make it up. It's that habitat that drives everything. Alabama is extremely popular for its coastal beaches. Uh, in fact, a major driver in our tourism economy is in Baldwin County in the beaches of Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, and Fort Morgan. At the Bon Secure National Wildlife Refuge, you can take a step back in time to see what our beach and dune system has historically looked like. Uh, granted, we have very much developed our coastline uh, for folks to use it, but the, the refuge itself is indeed a refuge of that habitat, uh, keeping intact uh, a very biologically diverse beach and dune system. You, you never, you, people think of beaches as flat. Uh, there are some very, very large dunes down in Bon Secure. Uh, even just years after hurricanes, those dunes rebuild themselves and migrate over time. And if you haven't seen them before, it's, it's well worth the trip down to the coast and to Bon Secure to, to see that beach and dune system intact. Back when we opened in April of 2007, the Commissioner of Conservation dedicated Delta Hall at Five Rivers to Jim Griggs. Uh, Jim has been the State Lands Division Director for 20 years, and in his term of service has seen many milestones reached. Uh, under his watch, the Alabama Forever Wild Program was created and has been implemented uh, to date, since it, start, since it started in 1992, Forever Wild has protected about 120,000 acres of land statewide, uh, nearly 50,000 acres of which were in the Mobile Tensaw River Delta. Uh, under his watch, we also created the Five Rivers facility and two nature centers, the Whaley Nature Centers in Bullock County, Alabama, and at Blakely Historic State Park in Spanish Fort. The purpose and I think the mission that Jim Griggs saw for these facilities was for them to be used as a tool for conservation. Uh, get folks engaged with the wild, wildlife and natural resource base. 
he simply saw us providing the tool for folks to use to learn more about the natural world that surrounds them. It is certainly appropriate to de dedicate Five Rivers and Delta Hall to Jim Griggs as we see in this facility his vision for future conservation efforts in Alabama. Uh, it represents a, a lifelong effort by him to protect and preserve habitats throughout Al Alabama. Cypress Gift Shop at Five Rivers is a unique outdoor themed gift shop. Uh, if you come in there, it's, it's really a museum store uh, because many of the items we have in there also tell a story. And, and I'll be honest with you, we're, we're selling hats and t-shirts and all these kinds of things with our logo, but we're also selling some items that are locally made, uh, locally handcrafted. We have pottery, for example, from a Fairhope artist named John Resner. He's, he uses a wood fire kiln that he built in his backyard and traditional techniques that date back thousands of years. Uh, pine needle baskets that are made by hand. Uh, local watercolor art. Uh, there's really interesting stuff in there. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's, it's worth the trip out alone just to come in and see what all's in the gift shop. And your purchases in our Cypress gift shop do support the mission and the conservation efforts we have here at Five Rivers. Uh, we put all of the proceeds from, from Cypress Gift Shop back into the facility. At the William Bartram Trail Conference event held this past year at the Five River Center on the Causeway, scholars from all over the Southeast gathered to talk about their research that they have taken years to conduct and produce that really reaches into the depth of the travels of William Bartram into this area and other areas throughout the southeast. Uh, in the uh, three-day conference event, uh, the first day was primarily devoted to uh, speakers uh, divulging their uh, research and in interactive uh, question and answer sessions, enlightening others as to what they have uh, found out about William Bartram. Later on, uh, members of the Bartram Trail Conference toured the uh, sites around the, the uh, Weeks Bay area, uh, the pitcher plant bog, and they got to understand some of the flora and fauna that is now still available in Baldwin County to viewers that William Bartram encountered on his travels in 1775. Fifteen years ago I met a native of East Lake, Alabama and I married her, actually Birmingham, and I've been coming down to Al I've been coming down here for the past dozen years or so and I'm always blown away at what a beautiful state Alabama is. It is the most underrated state in natural beauty in the entire nation. Um, that leads to William Bartram. Why should we read William Bartram? I think he provides a way of um, he provides a way of translating the landscape. When you read Bartram, you get words that you can put to the natural beauty of the place. My view is that the more people that know about this person, and the more people that know about the history of the South, the history of the region, the better care we can take care of the area. 
Um, I'm currently co-editing William Bartram's manuscripts. Bartram was born in 1739, died in 1823. He was a working naturalist through most of his life, from the age of 15 all the way to um, up into his 70s, up into the 18 teens, if I added correctly. Um, and during that time, you get a really incredible view into the ways in which people in the 18th century and the early 19th century understood the natural world. And that, to me, is an incredible story in itself. But what we always come back to is actually the physical beauty of the place itself. talk a little bit about William Bartram's uh, discovery of uh, what he called the golden enothera or the large flowered primrose, the giant primrose. It's a plant that he found in this part of Alabama on the uh, eastern part of uh, Mobile Bay on the Tensaw River. And it's a plant we have an awful lot of information about. We can track it when he found it, when he sent it to Europe, uh, what it did for a few years afterwards. He probably found it around August 6th or 7th of 1775, you know, a historic time when lots of other things were going on in America. And he was traveling with a bunch of uh, traders to the creeks or coming down to Mobile, and he stopped off at uh, Major Robert Farmer's uh, plantation, Tensaw, and got an invitation to come back and visit there. So he comes back and spends maybe a week with a boat. He had access to a boat or a canoe and could uh, uh, paddle up and down the river. And he noticed on the bank at one place this incredibly beautiful plant. He describes it as maybe the most pompous and beautiful plant he'd ever seen. I mean, he really thought it was one of the most beautiful plants in the world. He was fortunate to be able to get seed of it. Uh, and he took it back to Philadelphia. He sent some from Mobile in November of that same year to England to Dr. John Fothergill. And Fothergill was able to grow it in his greenhouse. and. Uh, presented it to Kew Gardens about 1778, so it's recorded in England, the discovery and presentation of it. And uh, for many, many years, the only place that plant was ever found was that one location on the, uh, on the Tensaw River. And uh, uh, it's an extremely beautiful plant, it has a very large flower. I mean, the evening primroses are found all across North America, but they're usually very small flowered ones. So this one has a really big showy flower and the plants can be very big as well. Uh, William Bartram says they're seven to eight feet tall and they might have hundreds of blooms at one time. Uh, and even today it's hard to find one that's quite that big, but you know, it's, it's a, a very impressive plant. And 
it's had a continuing heritage in this part of, of Alabama, uh, and it's still here. And botanists have come back over and over again uh, since William Bartram to find the plant, to collect seed of it, and it you know, wound up eventually being an important part of uh, genetic research and the discovery of how uh, inheritance works, how genes work, uh, and it's still being studied by geneticists in uh, Europe and America today. And it's, it's very important that places like this survive today that are what the na natural world was like. Uh, number one, it's a, it's a reserve that preserves the rare plants that were seen then. And again, many of these plants, people have discovered uses of them that weren't known in the past. They have medicinal uses, they might have scientific uses, uh, they're natural curiosities, they're beautiful, you know, they're, they're part of the natural world. So there's a, there's a real imperative to preserve a lot of this area. So it's, it's quite nice that so much of the uh, Delta area here is now under protection and is preserved and, and can be seen, will be seen by people hundreds of years from now and they'll be able to find the same plants. Yeah, as, as part of this conference tomorrow, we're gonna be taking a uh, canoe trip on part of the William Bartram Canoe Trail, which really will follow some of the same waterways that William Bartram, uh, you know, boated around on in 1775. Uh, uh, William Bartram had uh, Robert Farmer's, Major Robert Farmer's plantation as his headquarters and he would put his boat in there, but that's really part of the same uh, sequence of, of trails, the William Bartram Canoe Trail, uh, that you know, people can now take and follow and, and really experience the same kind of uh, communion with nature and you know, scientific curiosity about plants that William Bartram did. So hopefully tomorrow we'll see some glimpse of the same kind of world that William Bartram saw. Canoers gathered at Rice Creek Landing in Stockton early in the morning to embark on their adventure along the Bartram Canoe Trail where they spent a little over three hours paddling some of the same waterways that William Bartram would have traveled and visiting the state record bald cypress tree. The participants that are here this weekend for the Bartram Trail Conference are from all across the southeast each of us has sort of a different interest in William Bartram, the naturalist, and that's what has brought this group together. It's a group that's been together for about 20 plus years. Uh, the group meets every two years, and uh, my particular interest had been because Bartram Trail, Bartram, William Bartram, uh, walked down or rode a horse down the old Federal Road and the Federal Road just happened to go through the community where I grew up, which is Burnt Corn, Alabama. So my interest had been primarily in the uh, route that William Bartram traveled, and it's going to be pretty exciting to be here today and canoe in some areas that Bartram actually canoed in, and in 1776, 1777. So that should be pretty exciting, going back to where he actually uh, uh, ex had his own experience here in Baldwin County. This trip today we're taking uh, here in the Tensile Delta is a pickup from where we were four years ago when this group met in Montgomery, Alabama. On that particular weekend we uh, canoed the uh, Tallapoosa River which is a, a place in an area where Bartram spent some time at Little Tallahassee. Uh, so that was a special uh, weekend of being able to canoe on the uh, on the Tallapoosa and experience some of the places and see the river and see the part of Alabama which would have been pretty much like what he would have seen when when he was there. We're very fortunate that Catherine Braun from Auburn University has brought together a s select group of academicians that have been talking about William Bartram. Uh, they're from all over the country uh, from different universities and they're here to celebrate uh, parts of Alabama that Bartram actually experienced. So it's all about William Bartram. We all relate to him in a, in a different way um, and it's just great to be here today to be a part of this nature. I'm interested in the William Bartram Conference and I'm here this weekend in Bartram County to see some of the areas he explored in the Mobile area and the Delta area. The the flora and the fauna, especially the flowers. I'm a horticulturist, so I'm very interested in the plants that he may have seen and discovered and written about. Um, and the canoe trip we're taking today is going to be great because we're going to see where he was and maybe see some of the plants in person that he may have written about in some of his writings and drawn about. 
and we've already seen the evening primrose that he uh, discovered on our way in this morning, so we're off to a great start today. got a chance to uh, come along on this expedition at the last minute. I've always heard what well, a wonderful place the Delta was, and it's all true. It's a, <laughs> it's a great country down here. Well, I've canoed a good many of the streams around Alabama, and uh, they're all different, just like different people. And, uh, of course, up this sort of dark water and uh, the, the cypresses and everything down here is sort of exotic looking to us Montgomery folks, but uh, just awfully glad to be here on such a beautiful day.
We passed a large cypress tree back about 50 yards ago. It was a huge tree, a magnificent tree. And the top had been blown out probably about 50 years ago, but the tree had fully recovered. Uh, but you could see the uh, parts of it that had uh, blown, blown away, but it was a magnificent tree. oaks, when suddenly I beheld before me perhaps the showiest flower, the Onathara grandiflora. That's about all I can do. <laughs> probably still here is because three to four hundred years ago when logging started here it was probably too big to get out then. <laughs> that's that's really the only explanation we have why it's still here. So it's about 150 yards in, it's a pretty easy walk. One thing you need to be mindful of are cypress knees in this tall grass. Just use your foot slowly, sort of scrub the ground as you go. You don't want to hit one of those with your shin first. But stay on the trail and it won't be too bad. How did they get big timber out of this country? That was a very hard thing to do. Uh, I've read several books on it. Robert Leslie Smith that lives in Stockton uh, has wrote a book. And some of his immediate ancestors were part of the logging operations that went on out here. 
There's several different ways that they did this. One way, they would cut, bring a steam shovel in, uh, bring it up a channel like this at higher water. Now, mind you, you're at a full moon, low tide. This is as little water as you will ever see in this channel right now. Um, but they would bring a steam shovel in and dig a straight trench. And I can show you a lot of places the trenches are still there. They dig a straight trench, go in and cut the timber, wait on high water, leave the timber. Timber industry would go with that. Later on, when uh, you know the paper companies park the barge, harvest the trees, use the helicopter to take the trees from the property to the barge, they lost money on the issue. <laughs> Uh, and I forget, I think it was a, like a penny a ton, that's what they lost. But if the mill wasn't running, they lost a million dollars a day. This was reserved timber in here. They didn't touch this unless they were just totally out of timber. Uh, we work on it a lot. But, you know, we have 100,000 acres. Uh, some pretty rough accessible property. And the only way to kill this stuff by our means, once it gets this size, it's called hack and squirt, so you have to touch into each individual stem, so it's a, it's a long process. How long ago was it introduced? Uh, this plant was introduced uh, with the early settlers that came in. When we call it Chinese tallow tree, the seed coating was a waxy coating. They melted that waxy coating off to make candles out of it, so that's one of the reasons it got so widely spread. Is it introduced into Charleston? Charles? No, no, not to my knowledge. Probably too wet. Well, we're going to walk in right This is underwater much of the year. High water time, all this area is underwater. You know, I know I've seen a bunch of these shows of it. Send him a check. That's how much trust they have. Yeah. They didn't brand them. Well, the Bartram Trail Conference was designed to put people back in touch with not only nature but with history and their heritage. And today we are out canoeing on. Uh, Tinsaw and Tinsaw area that Bartram had traveled to in the 18th century, and we're trying to uh, get a little taste of what it might have been like for him to do the same when he traveled the same area so long ago. Uh, Bartram was especially appreciative of the native habitat here, the wonderful uh, new plants such as the evening primrose he discovered here, and was really on the lookout for botanical discoveries. He was also very sensitive to the new settlements that were here, such as Major Farmer's Plantation, which is 
uh, which was located in what's now Stockton. And so that's what we're trying to do today, to appreciate not only our natural heritage, but our uh, rich colonial history as well. Exhale, <laughs> my, my, my little 